Good morning, friends. I'm uh, today going to talk about uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices, and uh, these are three of uh, three categories. And the first one is uh, implantable loop recorders and insertable uh, cardiac monitors or ICMs. <clears throat> the second category is uh, cardiac pacemakers, which can be single lead, uh, dual lead or biventricular and last or third category is the implantable cardioverter defibrillator ICDs which can again be single lead, dual lead or biventricular. These devices are used for uh, rhythm management as pacemakers are mostly used for control of bradycardias, implantable cardioverter defibrillator ICDs for treatment of life threatening uh, ventricular tachycardias and uh, biomedical or resynchronization is done uh, in, with pacemakers and ICDs and used for treatment of heart failure uh, using ventricular resynchronization or CRT devices. This one, right? uh, This is a uh, plain x ray, a preview of a patient having a pacemaker, it's a dual chamber, and uh, it shows the uh, generator and the leads, and uh, the leads are in the right eight atrium and the right ventricle. Uh, this is uh, a ICD. You can actually see uh, the uh, shocking coil in the proximal uh, part of the heart. So, what happens if a uh, patient? Uh, with the pacemaker of these devices uh, attend uh, pre-op clinic. So when these patients attend, then you need to know whether the pace, ma patient has got a pacemaker, whether he's got a loop or is an ICD. And you contact a physiologist in the pacing or ICD clinic uh, with patient details and the hospital the patient normally goes to for routine checkup and also inform of the, them of the date of the surgery. So if the patient has a loop, in that case, you arrange for a pre-loop device check uh, just prior to the surgery, as the device may have automatically recorded any arrhythmias. And if you find anything uh, serious, then you uh, inform and follow up the results and escalate accordingly. If the patient has ICD or pacemaker, uh, we need to know if the device has been checked at appropriate intervals. Uh, you would want to know if there is uh, any follow-up overdue and uh, whether there were stable measurements. The pre-op anesthesia staff need to document in the case notes uh, that the patient has got a pacemaker or ICD. Uh, you also put the name of the physiologist uh, who has given the advice or has checked the pacemaker or ICD. Uh, if, the pa if the patient is uh, due for an hour check, uh, check of the pacemaker ICD or there is a device problem or the device is uh, normally followed up elsewhere, in that case you need to arrange for a pre-op device check uh, within your hospital. The pre-op anesthesia staff uh, need to follow up the results and escalate any abnormalities uh, to the consultant anesthetist. In case the patient has an ICD, uh, again, the pre-op anesthesia team will inform the waiting list manager uh, to add uh, the ICD device comment to theater management system. And uh, uh, where this uh, facility is not available, they need to inform the anesthetist involved or who will be anesthetizing the patient. Uh, the waiting list manager will also inform the pacing or ICD clinic uh, of the surgery date uh, when it's been allocated or there's been, been any change in the, in the dates if it was posted previously. If surgery date is not within six months of device check, uh, then the waiting list manager will inform the uh, pre op anesthesia staff and they will arrange new check and uh, re restart the whole process. Pacing your ICD clinic uh, will advise regarding procedure to deactivate and reactivate the device. So what normally happens in this case is uh, that uh, the ICD is deactivated in anesthesia room, anesthesia room on the day of the surgery. 
and for that we need to contact the physiologist uh, give them 10 to 15 minutes notice in the meantime you actually uh, attach the monitors uh, so you have ECG uh, blood pressure pulse oximeter and uh, the uh, physiologist will come and uh, deactivate the device and uh, post procedure uh, once the surgery is done uh, you need to again uh, ask them to come over and uh, reactivate the, uh, the device for pacemakers if the uh, TCI that is to come in date is not within 12 months of device check then the uh, waiting list manager to inform the pre-op anesthesia staff and they need to arrange new check and restart the procedure and in these patients with pacemakers we uh, proceed with surgery using standard precautions so when using diathermy we tell the surgeons to use bipolar whenever possible uh, use it in short burst and we look for uh, pacemaker inhibition uh, when the diathermy is in use post procedure pacemaker check is not required unless the diathermy was applied directly on the pacemaker wires or the generator or you notice uh, inappropriate uh, pacemaker function during the surgery so this is the overall uh, flow diagram of uh, what I have just uh, talked to you about uh, so whenever you see a patient with pacemaker or ICD uh, there are certain details you need to note you need to note the type of device and uh, who is the manufacturer a uh, place where it was implanted and followed up, uh, date of last check or follow up, and if the device is reaching replacement date, usually the generator batteries need to be changed, so generator has to be changed, so you need to know that. And where is the device located? Is it on the left infraclavicular fossa or the right infraclavicular fossa? And if there are any restriction plates, sometimes uh, some of these pacemakers or ICDs are implanted as part of clinical investigation. The patient normally carries a card and it gives you all the details. It tells you uh, the type of device, who the manufacturer is, uh, it, and some cards are small, the others can actually have a lot more uh, information, uh, say when the uh, it was implanted, when it was checked, when it was uh, due for the next check uh, this is a image showing how the uh, pacemakers are checked in the lab or even in the uh, uh, pre-anesthesia room uh, follow-up clinic should be able to confirm the uh, correct functioning of the device uh, it will check condition of the battery and leads it will advise on if any adjustment to sensing or pacing parameters is required and I will advise if the device needs to be programmed off and how and who will do it. There are certain pre procedure support uh, uh, should be available uh, within the theater complex. Uh, so when you actually have the pacemaker being, sorry, the ICD being turned off, uh, you need to have the ECG monitoring from the outset. And uh, uh, the all ECG monitors actually do not detect the pacing uh, automatically. You need to go into the ECG setting and you need to switch on the pacing mode. Otherwise, you won't see those spikes on the ECG. The theater should have external defibrillator and external temporary pacing uh, facilities and uh, people around should actually have the skills of doing a CPR in these patients. In patients with ICD and limited access to chest, it's always important to uh, leave uh, external defibrillator pads uh, connected. I'll show you that in the uh, diagram. So this is this is how uh, the ECG will look if the pacing mode is turned off. Otherwise, it just looks like a normal ECG. You won't know if there is any pacing occurring or not. Uh, these are the external uh, pads. Uh, these are disposable, so you can actually apply them and keep them. You don't have to connect them to the external uh, defibrillator, but if you need to, you can just connect in emergency. Uh, if pacemaker inhibition is detected on uh, use of diathermy, in that case, you inform the surgeon and uh, either ask 
them to use uh, diethylamine in short burst or ask them to discontinue altogether. Uh, in case of uh, there is device uh, programming uh, which is altered, uh, you continue to monitor the ECG uh, till you get the physiologist to come and have a check and uh, it is restored to pre-op settings. So one of the main worries with pacemakers is electromagnetic interference, which can lead to inappropriate device uh, functioning. The pacemakers do have protection against electrical and magnetic interference uh, by using special filters, uh, but uh, in a lot of cases, uh, they may not cause any problem, but if there is high energy levels and it is delivered very near to the leads or to uh, the uh, device, the generator itself, or if the frequency component uh, is very close to that generated by the heart. So the heart beats are 60 beats per minute, that is one hertz. So if you have devices which are generating uh, the noise at one to two hertz, uh, then uh, that can cause problems, uh, even uh, with the filters which are present. So when uh, these kind of interference occur, they can either inhibit the pacemaker, they can induce a fixed rate pacing, they can be software reset. And in case of ICD, patients can actually have, uh, they, they can trigger shocks, uh, which are not appropriate. The el electromagnetic interference, the effect is not permanent. It is transient and usually the device will return back to normal. But permanent effect can occur uh, if very powerful fields are used. Example is gamma radiation. Uh, uh, the patient is having radiotherapy done or a very uh, strong magnetic field are used like in the case of MRI. Now ICDs, uh, they're obviously a different ball game altogether. ICGs are implanted to treat uh, ventricular tachycardia as ventricular fibrillation. Uh, so the electromagnetic interference is misinterpreted as ventricular arrhythmias and inappropriate uh, anti-tachycardia therapy uh, is initiated and this delivers repeated shocks. So uh, not appropriate, so it will drain the batteries. There are some uh, special uh, impetus-based rate-responsive uh, pacemakers like minute volume sensors. So if these patients have that, in these cases, uh, interference from diathermy uh, or the manipulation of the device itself can be sensed by the uh, uh, pacemaker and can result in inappropriate high rate pacing. So if the patients have such devices, in that case is uh, uh, temporary uh, programming the device to a non rate responsive mode, uh, uh, it will prevent these uh, changes. Uh, this need to be done uh, prior to surgery. Uh, just like you would do uh, for an ICD. So what do manufacturers advise regarding plant of pacemaker on ICDs? Uh, most will contraindicate use of surgical diathermy or electrocautery as it is sometimes called and they give strong warning against its use uh, especially the monopolar or unipolar which is the most commonly used mode. So if your patient has got a uh, implantable loop recorder or insertable cardiac monitors, then no special precautions is required. But what's very important is that you interrogate the device before the procedure. Okay. And after the procedure, you need to clear all the diagnostic memory because it would have recorded a lot of these interferences as arrhythmia. So you need to actually just clear out the memory uh, so that they can now be used again. So we'll now go into some uh, specific procedures and see how the pacemaker or ICD need to be used. So if you have a patient uh, for surgery of head or neck or upper abdomen or upper arm above the elbow, for ICDs it is same for everything. You deactivate before surgery and reactivate immediately post-op. It just doesn't change. So uh, for pacemakers, uh, you might consider reprogramming if uh, the patient is pacing dependent and if prolonged diathermy is going to be used near to the device.
So if you're having a surge, for example, the device is in the left uh, infraclavicular fossa, and uh, you are actually having a surgery done on this say, left ear, or left mastoid, or a carotid surgery on the left side, then uh, you might want to uh, consider reprogramming the device. Um, but if there is no alteration in programming uh, or there are no adverse event, no post op checks are usually required. If you are actually having uh, surgery done on the lower abdomen, uh, lower limb, or uh, sort of upper distal arm below the elbow, then in that case, uh, no uh, reprogramming is required for pacemakers, and no post-op checks is required if no alteration programming or adverse events occur. For ICD, it is like I said, same. You deactivate before surgery and deactivate immediately post-op. For cardiothoracic surgery for pacemakers, uh, reprogramming is highly uh, likely because you're operating very close to the leads and uh, to the uh, generator itself, <clears throat> and you will uh, need a full post-op check. ICDs will be deactivated and reactivated as usual. Ophthalmic surgeries, um, for uh, monopolar dermal use, uh, if it is anticipated, then usual precautions, using short burst, use, um, ensure there's no interoperative inhibition, uh, but if there is no alteration, no checks are required. Uh, most ophthalmic surgeons will use uh, uh, the bipolar leads. Um, hardly seen anybody use monopolar. Uh, for ICD, uh, usual deactivate and reactivate post-op. For endoscopic procedures, uh, for pacemakers, uh, you just need to continue monitoring uh, during the procedure. Uh, no action is required unless pacing dependent and prolonged diathermy is used, or uh, if they are, the surgeon is planning to use argon beam. Uh, but then again, that is very rarely done. And no post-op checks if no alteration programming or adverse events. ICDs deactivate before surgery, reactivate before, sorry, reactivate after the procedure. Uh, dental surgery for pacemaker, usually no action is required unless uh, diathermy is anticipated. And again, no post op checks if no alteration in programming adverse events. ICD deactivation before surgery, reactivation uh, after, immediately after the procedure. Uh, lithotripsy is interesting, uh, uh, so general measures for diathermy to be followed, uh, avoid focusing the beam near the pulse generator, uh, and if lithotripsy triggers on our wave, uh, consider disabling the atrial pacing uh, during treatment. Now that's that's important because the lithotripsy is actually uh, linked to the uh, ECG. and. You don't need to actually interrogate the device immediately, but uh, you, after a month or after treatment, it uh, need to be interrogated to see if there is any changes. Uh, ICDs, uh, you need to deactivate before the procedure and reactivate after post-op. Electroconvulsive therapy, again, you just follow the general measures and you need to integrate device within one month after treatment because we're not going to use any Anything like chromatic uh, interference won't be there. Uh, we don't use diathermy or anything, so same thing. But for ICD, it's important that uh, you need to deactivate it before the procedure and reactivate it after the procedure. If the patient is going to have uh, nerve conduction studies or uh, EMG, uh, then you follow uh, the general measures. Uh, risk of interaction with uh, the uh, the CICDs, CIEDs is uh, raised only with uh, repetitive uh, stimulus. Uh, but if you're using single stimuli or a stimuli is applied to proximal arm, uh, then sorry, what I mean is that uh, if on, if the if this stimulus is single stimulus, then it doesn't matter. It's only a concern if it is uh, repetitive. And uh, if the stimuli is applied very pro uh, to the proximal alarm, which is uh, close to the device, then I need to be concerned. So you need to mon monitor to ensure there's no inhibition of pacemaker, and uh, you consider re reprogramming in patients uh, who are pacemaker uh, dependent. 
and if the stimuli is, uh, is repetitive and very close to the device. And again, no post-op checks are required if there's no alteration in programming uh, or there's no uh, adverse events. For ICD, usual deactivation uh, before uh, reactivation afterwards. In the patients uh, who are going radiotherapy, uh, the both pacemakers or ICDs may sustain uh, damage from the high energy. Uh, their uh, functionality uh, may be affected by the uh, radiotherapy itself. So the radiotherapy uh, beams can uh, damage the device uh, battery, uh, they can damage the circuitry, they can cause malfunction. Okay. And this happens uh, when the uh, doses of radiotherapy is increased. Uh, most people think that uh, radiotherapy does not uh, lead to electromagnetic interference. Uh, that is a misconception. Uh, the radiotherapy itself can affect the devices uh, similar to uh, diathermy. So inhibition of pacing therapy can occur and inappropriate shocks from ICDs can happen. So you need to again uh, switch off the ICD uh, before the radiotherapy and switch it on there. Uh, unfortunately, there's no national international guidelines or consensus about the uh, devices and radiotherapy. So you just have to use your common sense. Now, what about emergency procedures? Uh, so if a patient has got a pacemaker or a ICD and comes uh, for an emergency surgery, so uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, I think you follow the uh, same steps as we have described before. What you need to ensure is that uh, there is facility to perform CPR and uh, you are able to do a temporary pacing as per ALS. Now what happens if uh, a patient has got a pacemaker or ICD and patient sustains cardiac arrest? So in these cases, you carry out the resuscitation in the same way as if you did for a patient who does not have these devices. And if the ICD is delivering shock, don't worry, it doesn't uh, cause any risk uh, to the person who's performing the uh, compressions. Uh, for uh, external shocks, uh, you place the pad as far away from the device as possible and possibly in the anteroposterior position. And I will explain this uh, in details later on. Now, if the resuscitation is successful, I need to integrate the device uh, soon after the uh, energy from diffusion, because the shocks itself can actually affect uh, uh, the device. So you need to actually uh, integrate, get the get the physiologist to come and uh, check the devices. Uh, so if you have the pacemaker in the left pectoral uh, region uh, or left intra infraclavicular fossa, uh, this is how you would place the pad. So you have uh, the positive one uh, below the right clavicle and the negative one is placed at the apex posteriorly, so anterior posterior. If it is in the right pectoral region, then you actually move the pad down to the sort of uh, uh, the nipple area or a little below that and the negative one uh, still remains in the apical area. Uh, this is uh, how the anteroposterior uh, pad placement will look like from the side. The other important uh, question asked uh, by most people is uh, what about the use of uh, magnets? And uh, uh, these magnets are very strong magnets. They're specific magnets uh, which are you know, provided by the companies this is not just simple magnet which children play with. And the way the devices respond uh, varies from uh, the device with the different manufacturers. Uh, the response is usually temporary and normal function tends to resume as soon as you take the magnet away. In general, when you apply a magnet over the pacemaker, the generator switches to a asynchronous mode or what you uh, call as a preset uh, magnet rate or fixed rate. So if you have a pacemaker which is DDD, will be 
to convert to DOO, PV will convert to VOO. So magnets are useful in race situation uh, when data may inhibit spacing. You place the magnet over the ICD devices. But it is usually recommended that you do not uh, leave the magnet for a long time. Because asynchronous spacing can uh, be occasionally arrhythmogenic and you can have RNT phenomena. So use it in a very, very specific situations or where you do not have the physiologist. Um, like I said, the magnet response varies from manufacturers to manufacturers. What basically magnets are used for is to actually detect uh, the battery life. So when you place a, a magnet over the pacemaker, what it does, it, it goes to a fixed rate. Say so for example, the fixed rate for a pacemaker is say 85 beats per minute. But if you place the magnet and now the fixed rate is actually down to say uh, 50 or 40, that indicates that the battery is getting depleted and it's time to change the uh, generator. Uh, for patients with ICDs, um, if you place a magnet, it will inhibit the delivery of uh, anti-detect cardiac pacing and shock therapy. Uh, but it will have no effect on bradycardia pacing. So uh, the pacemaker will actually function as normal for ICDs, uh, but the, it will prevent any shocks. Yeah. So it's very useful in this situation. And like I said, the magnet response persists as long as the magnet remains close to the generator devices. And how the magnet need to be placed also depends on the device. So for example, Meritronic or Boston Scientific or Biotronic, you can place the magnet on the top of the generator. But for uh, the pacemakers, which are made by St. Jude, uh, they prefer that the magnet be placed either on the upper pole or the lower pole. You do not place it directly over the generator. And for uh, the uh, pacemakers, band, uh, which were made by uh, Lee Livanova, which was formerly Soren, and they say you avoid the header. So you only place the magnet on the lower pole of the generator. So it's just not that just place the magnet wherever you like. It's very specific uh, for the devices. That's why it's important to know who the manufacturer of the device is. And again, if you want to leave the magnet on for the duration of surgery, you secure it and uh, with tapes. Uh, some of the ICDs, uh, for example, in Biotronic, it reverts to normal after uh, more than eight hours of magnet placement. So if your surgery is continuing uh, beyond eight hours, what you need to do is, is uh, remove it. It will go back to normal setting and then again reapply it uh, on the uh, pacemaker. And if any subsequent uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation occurs, uh, then you need to use the usual ALS guidelines to use external defibrillator equipment. Uh, thank you for watching. And any questions you can uh, leave uh, below. I will leave the uh, video on uh, for some more times so you can clear your doubts.